there! Thanks for joining us as we're about to list through our top picks and suggestions from this month's board game releases and restocks. We're also going to take a peek at the newest games joining the game shelf, fix that light, and do a colossal deep dive into one of my all-time favorite things. It's all coming up in this month's Illuminating Board Game Buyer's Guide. All right, I'm Chaz Marler here with Watch It Played and a fresh pair of batteries. And our list of recommended recent releases and restocks starts off with several honorable mentions, including Freelancers, a crossroads game, which combines role playing with storytelling and some modern tabletop twists. This game aims to condense a fantasy RPG campaign experience down into a single night. Impossible? Perhaps not because players will still create a character, roll funky dice, and blaze their way through multiple stories in a world of magic, monsters, and, mayhaps, even murder. The game also has a companion app that helps lead players through hundreds of misadventures and decisions with full narration. And I got a chance to play Freelancers back in June, and I thought that this was a really great step in the continuing evolution of Plat Hat Games' Crossroads system. And I thought the writing in the game was absolutely fantastic. So kudos to the team that authored the scenarios because it brought the game to really new heights. Also reaching new heights is the meeple rolling game, Rolling Heights, in which competing contractors expand the city's skyline to new heights by rolling workers in the form of meeples. After rolling, standing up meeples work hard that day and provide special actions and building materials while face-down meeples, much like board game YouTubers, provide nothing constructive to society. Now, a player can always push their luck for better roles, but may lose valuable construction materials in the process. So there seems to be an interesting amount of planning as the city's buildings grow into skyscrapers, combined with the luck of the roll, adding just a little bit of havoc into the mix as is Seas of Havoc, which also adds Havoc into the mix, not only with its name, but also with the fact that in this game, pirates and privateers fight each other on the high seas for reputation and renown over the course of two different phases. In the first phase, which is a combat phase, players utilize multi-use cards to maneuver their ship, navigate obstacles, search shipwrecks, and fire cannons at their opponents. Boom. During the island phase, which is the second of the two aforementioned phases, players send out workers to various locations to gain resources, improve their decks, and repair and upgrade their ship. Seas of Havoc was also a suggestion in this month's People's Choice video by a viewer who said that, at first, the game looked like it was going to be a lot, but actually turned out to be quite manageable, and a cool sneaky little deck building game that also allows players to blow up their friends with cannons, adding huzzah. So, I mean, really, how can you argue with an endorsement for the game like that? But if persnickety pirates just aren't your thing, well, you could always turn instead to the Congossieros for help. This is a competitive game in which rival gangs try to survive in hostile desert territories while being hunted by the state police who have a license to kill. You. They have a license to kill you. So that's not great. In order to survive, management of several seven card decks is fundamental, with players using cards to collect resources, train their heroes, employ forces to guard regions, launch attacks on their pursuers, convert their resources, and recruit new members. And as the sun eventually sets over the desert at the end of the game, the band of outlaws that has claimed the most fame and remains on this side of a prison cell wins. And if you manage to avoid being caged in Congossieros, well, then you can turn to managing a collection of caged critters in Miller Zoo, a cooperative family weight game that puts players in charge of running one of Canada's most interesting zoos. And we all know how interesting Canada's zoos are by default, so <laughs> quite the accomplishment, Miller Zoo. Everyone plays together at the same time in this game to overcome challenges, unexpected situations, and crises as they strive to meet all the animal's needs before a central card stack is emptied. Those cards are distributed and played over the course of four phases, representing dawn, morning, afternoon, and evening. There's also six secretive envelopes included to discover, with new animals and new challenges, allowing the game to evolve from one play to the next. 
And another game that's continuing to evolve is the first one that helped make this episode possible, Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances from the Op Games, which is celebrating the release of its fourth expansion at the ready. Become the next master summoner in this Disney-themed strategic battle arena game, recruiting a fantastical battle-ready roster of Disney and Pixar heroes and villains, creating incredible combinations with endless replayability. And now, even more characters are at the ready in this appropriately named upcoming fourth expansion, At the Ready. Improve positions with Mrs. Potts, pull fast ones with Robin Hood, and aid allies with Mulan. Disney's Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances is the ultimate player versus player learn as you go tabletop game for Disney and Pixar fans and board gamers alike. So follow the link in this video's description to find Disney's Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances and its first three expansions now, and then at the ready in early September. And then, prepare yourself to enter the ultimate arena battle royale. An inevitable side effect of researching so many games each month is that several find their way onto my own shelves and gaming table. And this time was no exception, starting with Aerium, a trick-taking game for three to four alchemists who meld a myriad of metals into gold. After each player bids for how many tricks they think they'll take, playing cards begins. Tricks are almost the opposite of the norm in a trick-taking game, because instead of matching the suit that it was led, you can't play a suit that's already been played unless it's a gold card. Spooky. The round ends immediately when a player either can't or chooses not to play a card. Then, points are awarded based on how close the actual number of tricks you won was to your estimate. This seems like a simple, yet really interesting twist on trick-taking. But if you have even more players at the table, I recommend not spinning in your chair anymore and getting ready to send me a game called Scram, which supports three to six players behind you, behind you who work in teams to scare woodland critters away from their campgrounds by taking advantage of various card abilities to deduce which cards both your opponents and your allies have hidden in front of them. Attention and timing will both be necessary to trigger the end game at just the right time and earn your team the most points once the final scores are all tallied. Now, I first played Scram back in June with the rest of the Watch It Played team while we were all together for our two-day gaming marathon livestream. And this was one of the games that we played during the live stream, sure. But then the six of us played it together several more times off the clock as well. And I bet that the next time that all of us are together, I suspect that each and every single one of us is going to have a copy of Scram with us in our luggage to play again. I know I will. And speaking of suspecting things, brings me to Suspects, Claire Harper takes the stage in which players puzzle out perplexing plots inspired by Agatha Christie. This edition features streamlined rules and plots for three mysteries, presented in the style of Agatha Christie's novels. Claire Harper Takes the Stage actually came out in 2021 and is just one of nearly 10 different games in the Suspects line. So I may be a little late to the party, but I'm still looking forward to cracking a few classic cases with my friends and family. And then, in perhaps this episode's clunkiest segue, I'll admit it, I'll go from searching for clues to searching for the coastline in Beacon Patrol, where together, a collection of Coast Guard captains build and navigate the coast of the North Sea, checking beacon buoys and lighthouses to ensure its safety. The goal is to explore as many tiles as possible by connecting them on all four sides, and then moving your ships out to sea to explore the sea. And then, in addition to navigating unexplored oceans, I'll also be scouting Uncharted Lands in two expansions for Northgard Uncharted Lands, a game of exploration, survival, and conquest, and timing, based on the Northgard video game. The War Chiefs expansion, right here, includes a modular board, does it? Yes. The War Chiefs expansion, right here, still right here, still includes a modular player board for each player, providing seven clans with asymmetrical powers and the ability to upgrade their war chief. Meanwhile, the Wilderness expansion adds eight more creatures and 11 special environmental tiles to encounter, each with their own special benefits. 
across back to end of shelf. If you've ever been interested in trying out Northgard, then I think that either of these two expansions are a great place to dive right in. And, you know, diving further into our channel with a subscription would be a great way to go off the deep end yourself. Ha ha ha. And the tidal wave of underwater metaphors isn't going to stop there, because up next, we're going to take the plunge into a deep dive into a series of games based on one of my all-time favorite IPs. In the summer of 1982, my grandma took me to the toy store and let me pick out a little laser trooper, codenamed Flash, and a jetpack accessory. This was my introduction to the 3 and 3 quarter G.I. Joe series, and throughout the rest of my childhood, they were my favorite toys. In fact, I still have Flash in his trusty little jetpack, though his decrepit arms have been replaced with ones with unbroken thumbs and swivel arm battle grip, as you do. Now, the 80s series of G.I. Joe toys ran through 1994, but thanks in part to nostalgia, collectibles, and board games, the characters continue to live on even today. In fact, there's been a bit of a resurgence of new G.I. Joe games in recent years, and for a while now, I've been wanting to put together this checklist of sorts, charting the history of G.I. Joe tabletop games to rediscover where it's been, where it's currently at, and where it's going. And before we get into this, note that several of the games that are in this segment have been published by Renegade Game Studios, who, while not a financial sponsor of this episode, did help me out by providing some of their product, which we'll see in a moment. And now, let's dip our toes into the waters of our deep dive by starting with a bit of historical perspective, with the earliest game featuring the G.I. Joe intellectual property that I could find, the G.I. Joe adventure board game from 1982. In this roll-and-move offering, the characters, still referred to at this point only by their specialty instead of their code names, wander the board collecting equipment, making their way to various locations to complete missions and earn points. Among the places to visit includes the Pentagon, because what child's adventure fantasies don't include a tour of the U.S. government's Department of Defense building? Interestingly, its board also features Cobra Island, which wouldn't be introduced in the comic book series until three years later. Coincidence? I ac actually have, have no idea. But in addition to the adventure board game, the first G.I. Joe card game, called the G.I. Joe Card Game, was also released in 1982. As with its companion board game, the card game also refers to the characters only by their specialties and plays like a race to collect specific sets of cards. Collecting sets earns points, while accumulating Cobra cards provides players with a penalty. Oh, but then... In 1985, G.I. Joe upped its game, literally, with the release of the G.I. Joe Commando Attack game, which features an oversized board, 3D components, and the option to replace the provided cardboard standees with the action figures from your collection. <laughs> each of the 12 characters on each side could move, attack, be captured, free prisoners, raid buildings, or infiltrate the enemy headquarters to win the game. At the time, this was unlike any game that I had ever seen, and the Commando Attack game spent a lot of time sprawled out across my bedroom floor, playing out adventure after adventure. And then, more opportunities for adventure came the very next year, when G.I. Joe Live the Adventure was released in 1986, which scaled back the ambition of the Commando Attack game. One might say. Because in Live the Adventure, players roll dice to travel around a circular board, landing on enemies to confront in a rock-paper-scissors-style card battle. The winner collects a badge of honor, and then the first to collect six badge of honors, badges of honor. You get six of them, you win. Now, admittedly, that is not the most inspired of, of game designs, which may be why Milton Bradley attempted to recapture the excitement of the Commando Attack game by reintroducing it in 2002. Though the 2002 version of the Commando Attack game does share the same name as its predecessor, its components and rules were greatly revised to the point where it's considered to be a completely different game than its namesake. It also includes 3D cardboard vehicles that travel across the board and battery-operated disc launchers, which further increased not only its toy factor, but also its potential for serious eye injury. And then, in 2004, G.I. Joe joined the TCG explosion with the release of the G.I. Joe trading card game with an inaugural set that contained 114 cards, followed by one expansion providing 78 more. 
In the game, characters are played into two rows of ranks, which battle their opponent, with the last man standing winning the game. The G.I. Joe trading card game would cease production in 2005, ending the historical era of G.I. Joe games, and would be the last significant game based on the license for nearly 17 years. But then, in 2021, Renegade Game Studios launched the G.I. Joe deck building game, introducing the anti-terrorism task force into the modern era of game design. In this cooperative card game, each player begins with a basic deck that grows more powerful as they recruit additional teammates, gear, and vehicles, and then embark on increasingly dangerous missions against a collection of Cobra cronies. Missions can also branch off into side missions, each of which require the right combination of character skills and dice rolls to accomplish. So the right combination of both characters and equipment will need to be assembled quickly and efficiently because complications will arise and the clock is always always ticking against you. Now, several expansions have also been released for the G.I. Joe deck building game at this point, starting with Shadow of the Serpent, which features the Cobra Emperor Serpentor. Yay. As well as two new missions and additional Joes, items, weapons, Cobra Troopers, and the introduction of an expert mode to allow players to increase their challenge level. Cold Snap was released soon after that, which provided towable artillery and armaments, two more missions to achieve, and snow-themed characters, vehicles, and hazards. Its missions also focused on Destro and Zartan, making this set a must for anyone with a penchant for face masks, whether they be latex or beryllium steel. Now, the Raise the Flag campaign expansion introduced a campaign mode, surprise, which takes place over the course of several gameplays, each one raising the stakes as the results of previous decisions, successes, and failures are compounded over the course of its narrative, which incorporates the contents of several secretive envelopes that are opened as the story progresses. And, of course, in the tradition of the ridiculously oversized USS Flag. Introducing the G.I. Joe USS Flag aircraft carrier. It's so big! The Flag expansion includes an oversized constructible aircraft carrier, which will acquire upgrades as the campaign progresses. And then, the Joes acquire assistance of alloy allies in the most recent deck building expansion to date, New Alliances, a Transformers crossover. The Autobots here can provide transport for your units and be recruited as allies when they're in their robot form. There's an additional crossover mission, a new Energon dice pool, and the possibility of encountering the Decepticon composed of six bots in one, Devastator. It's so big! And for anyone that is making a checklist, I also wanted to mention that the release of a bonus box has coincided with each deck building expansion, which includes a couple of promo cards, leaders, or other small additions to the game. The G.I. Joe deck building game attempts to thematically incorporate the characters into its gameplay, a striking change from the games of the early 80s that only referred to the characters by their rank and specialty. But if you want to dive into those characters even further, then you may want to check out the G.I. Joe role-playing game, which has a library of several core and adventure books at this point. The G.I. Joe role-playing game is built on the Essence 20 platform, a D20-based system. Character creation follows a three-pronged approach based on their origin, role, and experiences, incorporating a variety of backgrounds, abilities, and even character flaws, all of which benefit from the acquisition of story points, which are awarded for successfully accomplishing objectives, heroic feats, and positively contributing to the role-playing experience. Several other RPG series use the Essence 20 system as well, including ones for Power Rangers, My Little Pony, and Transformers. But Let's return our attention to the 352-page core rulebook as the starting place for the G.I. Joe RPG, containing all the information and guidance needed to create a unique G.I. Joe character, rules for running a game, and an introductory adventure. Just add dice. In addition to the introductory adventure in the core rulebook, additional campaigns are also available, such as the 32-page one-shot The Emerald Oubliette, and Operation Cold Iron, a four-part adventure that takes a half dozen Joes across the globe from fiery deserts to the frozen plateaus of Siberia. There's also other one-shot adventures that are available as PDF products on Renegade's website. And once a GM is ready to expand the scope of their adventures even further, the Essence 20 Role-Playing System Field Guide to Action and Adventure Crossover Sourcebook is here and ready to guide you as soon as you make your way through its title. 
this book provides advice for developing stories in several of the Essence 20 universes and provides blueprints for combining characters and threats in an epic crossover between G.I. Joe, Transformers, and the Power Rangers. My Little Pony could also probably be worked into the mix as well if you so desire. But if you want to focus your RPG sessions on G.I. Joe while providing additional options for tabletop exploration and encounters, well, then there's a couple of sets of unpainted miniatures that are also available. First, there's the set of 12 28 millimeter heroes. Wow, that's a weird way to say words. There's a set of 12 28 millimeter heroes from the G.I. Joe roster, followed by a collection of 12 Cobra villains to confront. These may be worth checking out if you include tactical combat as part of your RPG sessions. Then, another recent release, which combines a pre-made adventure along with some tactical minis, is the Sergeant Slaughter accessory pack, which I believe is a special edition with a limited print run. This contains options for creating more types of characters, content for playing as Sergeant Slaughter and his marauders, a Sergeant Slaughter miniature, plus standees and maps that are used in its included scenario. Which is nice, because it's always great to have more Joes available to choose from. But what if that little voice on your shoulders has actually been leading you towards a more villainous career? Well, that is where the Cobra Codex Sourcebook comes into play, which features options for creating members of the mysterious Cobra organization, new influences, origins, focuses, and equipment. Rules for mutations and cybernetic implants are also buried in these pages as well. There's also resources for game masters and an original mission specifically designed for Cobra characters. So, if you're interested in a listing in the G.I. Joe universe on either side of the law, there's already a lot of RPG adventures ready and waiting to go, with even more content already in the works. For example, later this year, Volume 1 of A Ferocious Fighter Sourcebook is going to be released, which is going to introduce seven new factions, mechanisms, specialized equipment, and content for GMs. So yeah, it looks like there's plans to support the G.I. Joe RPG for quite some time to come. But what about the strategic board game experience? Well, that's where G.I. Joe Mission Critical comes in a cooperative miniatures board game that takes characters around the world in the battle against Cobra, their favorite thing to do. Mission Critical is built on the Guardian system, which was first introduced in the game Power Rangers Heroes of the Grid in 2019, in which players must manage their actions and coordinate their defenses, moving to the locations under the most threat, and doing battle with enemies while picking the right time to rest and recover between engagements as they prepare to defeat the mastermind behind each various plot. In addition to custom dice and three vehicle packs, each of which add cards, providing players with more firepower, Mission Critical has also received several expansions, the first being Heavy Firepower, which I can't show you the box for because it's already been fully integrated into this one. Regardless, the first thing that Heavy Firepower adds is the hero's roadblock, bomb strike, and gung-ho, plus the villain's destro, and the woefully underappreciated, underutilized Scrap Iron, one of my favorite Cobra key tiffs of all time, who I could carry on about and realize that I already am, so I will stop and now return to the list of Mission Critical expansions instead. Yay, Scrap Iron. Mission Critical's Chaos Break expansion was released shortly after Heavy Firepower, bringing with it Zartan and the Dreadnoughts against Beachhead and Ripcord, which I found to be a particularly interesting team-up, because in issue 45 of the G.I. Joe comic from 1986, Ripcord and Zartan engage in a deadly duel on Cobra Island, which sets up a history of bad blood between these two characters. Then Sergeant Slaughter returns to your table in the appropriately named Sergeant Slaughter figure pack, which includes him, his special unique vehicle, and a set of combat cards based around the character. Then, the first of two expansions that were newly released this summer is Midnight Storm, which is packed to the gills, not with fish, but with notorious ninjas, led by the iconic anti-hero, anti-villain? I morally burdened character Storm Shadow, confronted by Jinx and Mutt, along with his canine companion, Junkyard, which, in turn, was followed by the most recent expansion to date, Vanguard Strike, which brings Lady J, Flint, and Barbecue into the mix as playable characters, along with several new vehicles and enemies, including the Night Creepers and Saboteur Supreme Firefly. Which brings us up to speed on the current titles that are available for G.I. Joe board, card, and tabletop games. But 
What does the future hold, you may ask? Well, in addition to surely more content for each of the current series that we've covered here, there are a few more surprises in the works, such as G.I. Joe Battle for the Arctic Circle, which was actually just announced while I was working on this episode, scheduled to be released in 2024. This game is going to be based on Axis and Allies, meaning that the G.I. Joe brand, which has been successfully reintroduced over the past few years, is going to be merged with another classic from the 80s, which is about the best bet that you can make for the next entry in the current G.I. Joe line of tabletop games. But there are five more best bets that are available right now, which we're going to cover in our next segment after we thank the other game that helped make this episode possible, a game featuring another IP that has stood the test of time, the Marvel comic series of unmatched titles from Restoration Games. Did you know that the hit card-driven series of Tactical Showdowns Unmatched has four sets full of Marvel heroes ready to join you? Well, five actually, if you count the Deadpool expansion. Six, if you count correctly by including the brand new Brains and Brawn release featuring Spider-Man, She-Hulk, and Doctor Strange. So yes, let's go with six. But not only that, each and every set is fully compatible with all the other unmatched sets, which means you can mix and match as much as you want. Go nuts. Spider-Man can challenge Bruce Lee, or Moon Knight can seek revenge on Little Red Riding Hood, because she knows what she did. Each and every edition includes stunning artwork, highly detailed pre-washed miniatures, and unique thematic character abilities. The Marvel Unmatched titles aren't going to be around forever, so follow the link in this video's description to find your favorite sets and prepare for some truly epic showdowns. And I'm actually leaving this. This is the way I'm going. See you in a bit. And now it's time for this month's best bets. If you're looking for a new board game to enjoy with your friends and family, then, well, at least in my opinion, any one of the following is worth looking into. Starting with Race to the Raft, a cooperative, path-building, tile-placement, social puzzle board game who guide cats across the smoke-filled Isle of Cats towards a rescue raft waiting to sail them away to safety. You know, that old theme. As the players build pathways, fire, represented by various tiles, spreads across the island, limiting their options. Players will need to strike a balance between creating long pathways and keeping the cats ahead of the flames as they move towards the raft over the course of 81 different scenarios. Race to the Raft is a spiritual sequel of sorts to the immensely popular Isle of Cats, so it makes sense that those who enjoyed its perfect predecessor may also enjoy Race to the Raft as well. And another sequel of sorts among this month's best bets is My Little Everdell, a variation of the card drafting game Everdell, this one designed especially for younger players. Join Chip, Sweep, and the other kids of Everdell to build the most spectacular make-believe city anyone has ever built. Designed to be an easy-to-learn worker placement and tableau building game, My Little Everdale still hopes to get the brains of little ones a buzzin' with challenging choices and rewarding decisions. And another game full of rewards and revelations to explore is Archais, a cooperative, story-driven campaign game full of steampunk-inspired minis and 3D rooms set amongst ancient Egyptian ruins. Each of one to five players controls an adventurer as they explore a modular board, using their actions to move, search, and assist their allies in fighting the numerous dangers that are awaiting them. Each scenario has objectives that the players will try to accomplish in order to earn rewards which can provide upgrades and new options for their characters, which are retained from one adventure to the next. This game has a fantastic table presence and a level of accessibility that I think makes it a really good candidate for family game days. But if you'd rather just throw a monkey wrench into pure cooperative gameplay, then check out City of the Great Machine, a one versus many strategy game covered in the cogs and clockwork of a Victorian steampunk universe where an alliance of heroes rage against the Great Machine, an artificial intelligence network which can be controlled by either a player or automated rules. Either way, the Great Machine's ultimate goal is to suppress social unrest and complete its grandiose master plan to perfect mankind. And we all know how well that always goes. Now, as I was setting up to record this segment, a delivery of the Great Machine just happened to coincidentally arrive on my doorstep. So, 
I am going to be adding this to my wish list. And well, by next month, we should know that this little guy right here is going to make the crossover from my wish list to the game shelf. In the meantime, though, while I was researching City of the Great Machine for this episode, I kept coming across comments from players who praised this game, saying that it was like no semi-cooperative game that they had ever played. Which, obviously, is extremely intriguing. Those comments, combined with its mechanisms, artwork, and support for either all against one or fully cooperative play against the game itself, make this game not just a game, but a game I'm going to say is it make this game not put this game make this game not put this game into this month's best bets. <laughs> Maybe by next month I'll I'll have that whatever I was going to say there figured out as well. In the meantime, though, which was also the case, sure, for this month's biggest bestest bet. Dawn of Ulos, in which players compete by manipulating the land and different factions that populate it, wagering on the rise and fall of those factions' empires. This is another game that I actually just happen to have right here, but uh, not because it was just delivered, but because I've been playing the living daylights out of this thing. See, at, at first, Dawn of Ulos may look like a territory control game, but actually at its core, it feels more like an economic stock speculation game, which requires investing your resources in certain factions to help build up their value, and then divest from them at just the right time before they're defeated and wiped off the map. As I said, I have been playing this one, and I first played it back in June in the after hours during our live stream marathon, and I was immediately taken by it. I obviously tracked down a copy of it as soon as I returned home, and <laughs> I've already introduced it to at least a half dozen other people. Seriously, this is one of my favorite games of the year so far. But you know, if you didn't find your next favorite game in this episode, well then don't fret, because it may be in our most recent Momentum countdown, which lists 10 or more of the hottest board games that are currently building buzz and discusses why. So click here to join me there, and thanks for watching.